Hello everyone, today we talk about the organization of the Merovingian army. So this is a huge topic, we will have to come back on it multiple times because it really stretches um, over a very long time in space uh, and we have addressed Frankish history on many occasions. Uh, today we look fundamentally just the basics of the Merovingian military organization always given naturally uh, a specific political and social context, because otherwise it, there is not much. Um, I can say even of a difference, right? Because there are certain certain cultural shades that are important to grasp. But all these Romano-Germanic systems didn't differ in you know substantial ways in the way that their military worked. But from a practical point of view, it's not about these political and social strength ratios that have to be understood. And definitely Merovingian Francia and its dependencies, let's put it in this way, um, is definitely a, an exception. Right here we're talking about effectively the largest power in Western Europe, an enormous dominion that since the, the 6th century basically stretched from the Pyrenees to northwestern Germany. It encompassed several peoples. It was not just about the Franks, hence for, um, hence where the term not much Merovingian kingdom proper, but Merovingian empire comes from. In, in all the videos we've made about the Franks, the Merovingians, we have observed how you know very early the imperialistic tendency of the Franks had been formed, right? Uh, because of peculiar characters, and now we can't repeat. You can go back in Frankish history playlist to, to see a bit of that but uh, it w this was effectively an empire right because the kingdom did encompass essentially these areas comprehended between the, the Loire and Scheldt rivers that were encompassing in fact with the Neustria and, and Austrasia as these two lands that would remain historically also in the Carolingian times um, and it had different characteristics on, on, on their own, but this were, these were the core lands of the Franks, right? or at least those were the, the Franks had settled after having come out of Germany. And that's the, the, the center of power of, of the Merovingians, from which they extended over other populations, take Aquitaine, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, eventually there is the absorption of, of the Thuringians, they reached as far as the, as the Bavarians, fundamentally, so it, it was a big chunk of this massive and very fertile Atlantic plains that also were the, the, the practical mean through which um, to agricultural resources to which the Merovingians effectively could maintain um, a substantial force in arms, right, for, for, for a long time. The main problem here is mainly political, right? The resources of gold uh, surrounding areas weren't really... Um, exhausted over time. Naturally, there is a, a general uh, European trend of um, decrease over this time. There is a shrinking of the uh, demographic and economical uh, resources, and this is particularly even it. And it goes in parallel, though, and it's not a coincidence, with the shrinking of the same uh, Merovingian political power that sometimes it's been too stereotypically said, oh, well, you know, basically, you know, this, this state uh, declined irreversibly and it was not powerful anymore. Well, this is not really true. I mean, even in the 7th century Merovingian power w was a force to be reckoned with. The main problem being that it was fragmented in, in the within, right? It, were, it was basically four different kingdoms within what we call the, the, the Frankish Empire at this point. And um, they were constantly fighting one against the other. The, 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 the true center was, was today's France, fundamentally, because uh, the lands of Austrasia were fundamentally more militarized, a bit more as a frontier with with Saxony and other uh, Germanic peoples um, of Germ what would be in today's Germany. And this broader area of, of gold constituted by the corner formed by uh, Neustria, essentially, and its b its b partition as it would become eventually, and and Aquitaine from one side, Burgundy from the other, with uh, that. Kind of the the the, the Merovingian power is concentrated in the in the corner proper. So in this area of central France, around cities like Orléans or Paris, right, we will see the importance of cities in here as well. And these were uh, fratricide wars that really worn out the same Merovingian power because the Franks, as other 
uh, people, Germanic peoples definitely maintained the habit of splitting the inheritance among all the male sons. And, and therefore the kingdom that, and, and the empire at this point proper that the, the Merovingian dynasty had founded went split every, every single time. So that's, this is the thing that really messed up Frankish history and also later history for a very long time because telling the truth, uh, even the Carolingian parenthesis in many ways was, was triggered by the, the luck that individuals like, for example, Charlemagne or Lee de Pius had in hand or their male sibling, their brothers, uh, dead, fundamentally. Um, but uh, it wasn't a stable system, and we have explained reasons why. It's because this world was actually not developing um, a, a public power as such, right? Probably Clovis, the, the, in this very early phase of expansion, of it, entering in what was Roman Gaul, effectively, brought to an attempt of centralizing, of creating some sort of public system that was obviously decentralized, but it failed on, on the long run. And part of the reason being that, um, you know, the, the wealth distribution in the same goal, in the sense that this was very massively stratified, right, differently from other areas in Europe at that time, uh, Gaul, we've seen it, you know, had already displayed these characteristics from the Gallo-Roman uh, world of, of a, a huge amount of, of power in, in the hands of very few people. So even the origins of the Vassalatic beneficiary system, and we've seen this with the Commendatio, the Frankish Commendatio, even before, far before uh, the, the Carolingians, um, had helped structuring essentially a, a um, private political culture. I mean, the idea that effectively power was detained because of prestige of lineage and and this was reinforced by the Merovingians that saw uh, their kingdom not as the kingdom of um, the Franks in a kind of egalitarian slash, let's say, this is these are anachronistic terms as you understand, but kind of a democratic society where it's the the Frankish people that rules, right? No, the the, the very opposite and an exception in uh, or maybe the, the complete opposite of what tendentially the Germanic political culture had was at the time, that was essentially the kingdom as a private possession of the king. I mean, literally, conceptually, in, in frank, in Merovingian political practice, you find that the king owns literally everything, namely, right? So, uh, there is a great problem here, as we will see today, to actually maintain control of this system, but it was still done through... Uh, the same private means, right? So partly through decentralization, partly through by fueling this system that will intensify brutally in, in Carolingian times uh, as a vassalatic beneficiary system from which eventually what we call feudalism would have emerged. But that was already here. I mean, it was here even before the Franks in Gaul. Um, the same Gallo-Romans had it. Um, Part of the reason was that Gaul had not uh, seen major destructions like other areas of the empire. So basically all these enormous latifundia, typical of late Roman society, had remained intact. Even even the military, right? You know that Gaul had quite important strategic um, uh, role in, in um, late antiquity. Um, it had seen, you know, traditionally the, the Rhine border where the where, uh, Gaul ended um, was heavily militarized. It was all a, a logistical and infrastructural base over which the Romans had relied for maintaining hundreds of thousands of soldiers for for centuries. So large parts of the of, of this stuff entered in the in the hands of, of the Merovingians and their um, dependents. Uh, l let's put it in this way. So this story is very fascinating because. Um, on the long run, um, the, the, first of all, there is this major uh, wave of expansion under Clovis that really creates what uh, will make even the, the Byzantines at that point freaking out because you can, uh, we made s certain videos on this, how Justinian's Reconquest, at the end of the day, it was really aimed at uh, countering, at least in large part, um, Frankish expansionism. I mean, they even invaded... Uh, uh, Byzantine Italy, I mean, after it had been reconquered by the Ostrogoths, and this is the the binomium that will go on, historically speaking, but after the crisis of the late Merovingian period, with the Carolingians that basically 
uh, create even from their perspective the the, the, the recreate the Western Empire and to oppose again Constantinople. Um, but today we don't talk, we don't arrive at that point. We will fundamentally stop at the late seventh century because that's when the Carolingians start effectively rising. You know the the um, the, the Merovingians end in at the mid eighth century formally, but the the Carolingians were already by that time in charge of the situation. And you can say though that it, it's subjectively true that by by the the end of the of the seventh century. There was no such thing like a, an actual Merovingian empire or even kingdom, because once again there were essentially four chunks, all ruled by the, the various major domes, because these were these powerful palace officer officials that took matters in their own hand um, as m political military commanders, uh, while the the Merovingians were progressively isolated. Um, and, re and relegated even, and that's how even the Carolingians emerged on the uh, northeasternmost frontier. Um, uh, and the, the, this whole picture is very meaningful because there was effectively a vacuum of power at that time, and um, the thing paradoxically accelerated further the privatization and decentralization of power, and yet to form certain estates and clientels that eventually helped the Carolingians to, with, with their force, with new injection of power and this uh, polarization towards the, the, the craft of war from a professional point of view, it was something very new to Romano-Germanic Europe, um, wa wa was eventually formed. Because at the end of the day, um, the Vassalatic beneficiary system, yes, it, it's the decentralized system, but if you have a common goal, you can essentially um, redistribute resources you, you gain. Uh, it's something that works, it's something that effectively allowed the Carolingian Empire to happen in the first place and to change uh, the history of Europe forever. But even in that case, you realize that there was this major phase of expansion that was very long, but eventually nothing really, that like, there was not a skeleton of a state there to, to remain. And th this was the great, um, I mean, there were certain pros and cons to this, but it's obvious that at the end, at the end of the day, uh, there was no uh, proper statal continuity, but not even a state. Uh, right. Yet this is where the the professional, the the military class of medieval Europe emerged from. Right. Because in this stateless world, it was just privates that ruled, and these privates began to to swallow literally everything they had around, um, and forming powerful bonds among each other, clienteles, and essentially flattening ever more, so, so, you know, the lower strata of society, so that they could would be essentially revolving exclusively around them and providing them the means to sustain this prolonged warfare so that uh, you, you, you really don't find in Europe uh, kings that have uh, the same amount of power that even just a, a, um, a Frankish nobleman, uh, an Irish Frankish nobleman had because that level of privatization hadn't quite existed in other places, right? And for, from a civil point of view was a positive thing. It could be easily seen in Anglo-Saxon England. It could be seen easily in, in Longobard Italy. Uh, Visigothic Spain was something w that came closer to that, but eventually didn't um, function particularly well. At least we don't know because they, they were conquered by the, the, the Muslims. But who knows? Uh, the point, though, is that there is a general tendency towards the, the professionalization of warfare, as we'll see now, and the core lens of this phenomenon were definitely the, uh, the, the, the Merovingian ones. Let's say Merovingian, not Frankish, because as we've seen, they encompass also other, other territories. So, um, in this frame, we, we can start talking about the, the bulk of military power. You know, if these um, uh, great magnates and, 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 and princes and, and sovereigns are structuring their power uh, on the base of their private clientele, it's quite obvious that these figures were primarily fighting with, with, with a personal retinue or bodyguard of warriors that constituted the elite of this war. And it's the, the closest that exists, in fact, at that point to what would become uh, the, uh, the the knight, as we conceive it, on, on on the terminology of knight, th there can be uh, 
debate where people who don't consider knights even those of the 12th century because there were further developments eventually so especially from a technical point of view but I appreciate much more the, the political and social idea of knight right the knight is he who effectively belongs to the militia in Latin the miles that at this point is uh, becomes uh, equivalent of the equus right so of the cavalryman and of the of the heavily armored cavalryman um we'll talk about cavalry a bit later now but for consi- consider picture always in mind the habit of these retinues to be increasingly mounted right uh, many people say oh well just because this was also a, a large dominion cavalry was more important well yeah it has probably also to do with that but it's not quite the the thing it's really about how much wealth these people owned like you don't become a cavalryman just because you have to go i don't know 1000 kilometers away in a campaign right um it there is um also because we know the infantry that too um it's really about even fighting at one kilometer of distance but adequately um armed in fact and uh, presenting a, a with a might that is to be reconned by by your enemies so these troops are called in various ways in in the sources that are not categorical that there is no scientificity in this terms but the etymology of the terms are quite quite meaningful so they were called puri amici soci armati fideles sodales satellites or more famously actually antrustiones so what this all mean so uh, poor you know it's uh, essentially the, the boy the, the young boy the, the, the initiated like the guy who starts what would become the squire right so there was this idea among the the, the, the the frankish aristocrats that was shared by other peoples as well but here the aristocratization in the the increasing aristocratization of society have, had it made it m- much more um ha- habitual let's say to send uh, their young uh, boys in fact to be schooled in, in the craft of war under uh, the, the most powerful uh, the, under the lord fundamentally it could be the king but could easily be just a local count we'll see better the, the military organization in this regards later and and that's how they entered the military retinues to go there essentially to fight to become warriors proper right so here we're not talking about the average uh peasant of you know frankish gallo roman origin what uh, what's it's this these are essentially the the elite right um and and once again this elite is actually mixed it's that mixed a, a characteristic of of the merovingian world as the carolingian one is that here there's no concrete difference between germans romans gauls or whatever they did they were at the time and the, the, this is a great melting pot we'll see later how entire communities of gallo romans eventually would become frankish by by identity by right because that's how uh, it worked and this is typical also of other um, areas of europe and all it counted this was the only discriminating factor is in fact how rich you were how powerful you were right and not even in in, in tax terms um but in in terms of sheer power right go go it's freaking huge right he, here the problem is also to connect all of these territories that already have uh, the resources to sustain locally certain elites that can mind their own business and be rightfully suspicious about the attempts the initial attempts especially of centralization of the merovingian uh, power so then uh, amicus which means friend simply so this tells you uh, it's quite eloquent socius which is the associated the ally literally so someone who is bo- um, who is connected to you by a bond of um, of client early nature right this is the same these are all latin terms as you understand they were used by the same late romans in gaul right uh, armatus which means literally and here stresses the the strictly military character of the story and that that's very important so you you start seeing d- d- distinguishing someone who actually bears arms uh, which differs from uh from the freemen that theoretically in the frankish mindset had to be the the, the armed by standard here there is a social uh, certification that is quite important many germans would would become peasants right while uh an elite of them together with an elite of gallo romans would become instead ever more powerful 
this is very similar uh, you know in in general conceptually to other to other areas of Europe for example in Ostrogothic Italy there was the saying that uh, the uh, the poor um, German w would become uh, a Roman while um, uh, the rich Roman would would become a German and this is this is very very meaningful because uh, it makes you understand what it means to talk even about uh, a Germanic kingdom as such. It's really about how many people you can co-opt and form uh, solid, you know, um, uh, milieus and, and clientele so you can use. And at that point, the discriminant doesn't exist anymore uh, between the the invaders and, and the locals, right? It's all about what already has power. And in, in fact, in Ostrogothic Italy, differently from Longobard Italy, would be much closer in, in, in dimensionally to... to to the Merovingian um, Francia, because uh, that's where in Italy the, the great Latifundia had not been yet destroyed, a bit like in, in Gaul, in fact, and in, in, that instead will, will maintain that on the long run. So this system would, uh, would fuel itself, um, would keep fueling itself. Then you find Fidelis, which means literally the faithful, right? So someone here that is, is uh, tied to you by... Uh, an oath of, of, of loyalty, of fealty, and that's essentially the commendatio from which the Vesalitic beneficiary system will, will emerge. The sodalis, which means in fact also someone who is basically um, solid with you, like that he, he, is, he, he sticks around, <laughs> right, because he depends on you and he is committed to remain under your... Uh, your power in some ways. Then the satellites, that once again, here is a kind of an astronomic term, right? It's literally the guy who gravitates um, around you in some way. Um, um, and then the antrustionis. The antrustionis is a, a bit more of a complex term. We, we don't mm, even know practically the uh, with certainty the etymology, but it should come from the Salian Frank uh, trust, which um, the Latin uh, glocks uh, um, translate as auditorium, right? Which just have very different uh, etymologies. It means a help, right? It's someone who basically, it, the, the, from the Germanic, it, it's, it's different. It means actually, yes, aid, but probably fidelity and trust itself, right? Uh, if you look at old high German trust, that, that's, that's the thing. And there is an alternative uh, etymology that connects it, in fact, to the Proto-Germanic uh, Drutitz, which means war band, and probably there are connections in this regard, at the root, which is um, the old Ger German uh, Truth, for example, and perhaps even the Slavonic Drutzina, that were effectively the same things. I mean, this military retinues based on relation, contractual relations of, of loyalty in a client early um, bond, right? And the antrustionis, and here, here are, is the term that, as far as you know, will, mm, you know, it, it's at least the most famous, the most used, and that I, it comes to identify over time, not just this bond, but effectively the fact it was a, a military bond, and therefore creating a unit proper, like the antrustionis were the elite of the Merovingian army as such. Uh, bound to the king's service by oaths of loyalty, right? But also other uh, smaller um, dynasts. We can't literally say in here. It was really a matter of blood uh, had similar uh, retinues. Think about the, the origins of the Carolingians who were technically the Pipinid Arnold things, right? They emerged from a local a Frankish count and, um, and, and a bishop, right? The daughter of bishop married the D. Uh, the head of the family of uh, what would become the Carolingians, hence the Pepinid Arnold things. And here you f find, in fact, the great importance of the church, right? This is also very important to stress that in the Merovingian world, um, the uh, clergy is uh, as powerful as secular authority. I mean, literally, they are well rooted often in, in the cities, but they also have a lot of land and power in the countryside. They uh, they have the military retinues. They have the same lifestyle of, of the lay aristocrats. They're literally the same lifestyle, um, and they pursued essentially the same uh, political goals, right? And mm, this is very important also because the the as you know, the, the also in the high Middle Ages, the clergy, especially in these lands, 
Central Europe, but will maintain a, a quite important uh, military role, as a matter of fact, um, and uh, and also a quite close vicinity, proximity, and affinity, politically speaking, to the same monarchy. Right? These guys backed consistently the Merovingian uh, monarchy that had been founded by Clovis exactly in alliance with the Catholic Church. This is the base of all. Clovis is, we've made videos about him, he understands perfectly that when comes in Gaul, he can't, the, the Franks were still pagan at that time, right? They hadn't even passed to, to Arianism, probably, I mean, some did, and um, also their paganism was substantially modified from, uh, from one of the origins, but kind of a, towards a more monotheistic direction, but fundamentally they were pagan, and he understands that if he wanted to, to enter Gaul, he had he couldn't do without the support of the local Gallo-Roman um, bishop, episco episcopal system. And so it happens, and he conver he's gets converted to Catholicism straight away, unlike the other Germans that had passed through Arianism. And the church helps him, by the way, to decapitate, literally, all the other major shiftings that could compete with him for, for the kingdom. Also because the, the Franks up to that point didn't have anything like a kingdom. There, there were literally just a set of different tribes, of different um, clans that um, actually placed a lot of importance in their in their freedom. Right, The same name, Frank, it's re literally stressing this, like the Alamanni, all the men. These were typically uh, kind of democratic names, were um, proper of the of the very low socially, politically stratified Germans that had come out from literally Central Europe at uh, this time. And this is very important for recruitment eventually because um, it, it would favor uh, Clovis' attempt to basically extend his own personal power over all the other Frankish people that now had basically been deprived of their of their leaders of their chieftains and would have to be to refer to to someone else even though this would fail in the long run because many freemen basically said answered not like they didn't want absolutely to uh to support this um what in their eyes would have seemed something incredible by germanic standards but they were from the losing side of, of the aisle at that point historically because they would fundamentally impoverish and and Clovis would manage to, to build this highly stratified uh, society where just a, a very few ruled and all the others were easily subjected and they, by the way, were assimilated quickly. Um, and in, However, Germanizing in part the same culture, especially north of the Loire, there is a consistent historiographical consensus that, albeit we don't know the exact um, you know, demographic ratios, the, the population became formally German uh, from, from a political, uh, ethnical point of view um, because they, uh, the, the, it was scarcely populated, so that migration had a consistent impact. But it was not the point. The point was that, you know, even for the locals to become Frankish would m meant to, to acquire certain prerogatives, right? And as it, throughout all the migration era, the blending of the populations was uh, quite quite quick. Uh, the the main resistance in, remained when when there was, in fact, at, at an elit elitary level. It said Clovis wiping out all the other chieftains had got rid of that. Right, so all the clashes that existed in other um, Germanic kingdoms because of the old thing of the Arians and of the Catholics didn't happen in here. And it kind of strengthened as hell th this dominion. That's why it became the most powerful all over uh, Western Europe. It managed to defeat also all the others around uh, at the end of the day. Um, so um, there were. So Clovis built properly a monarchy as such, a, a personal, individual, dynastic monarchy that is, uh, you know, with, with certain continuity. We, uh, it's not to be stressed excessively, but it's literally what the, I would say, the political religion of France has rem has remained over time. Different dynasties came to rule, but this idea that there was a fundamental alliance between the monarch as such and the the church as such is something that will remain um, un you know untouched up to the, the French Revolution and enhanced um, over time. 
But even later, French Revolution, it is the idea of the status as something as a decisive that had become at that point, uh, naturally, a part of a, um, of, of a, an identitary character. You know, it, these were the, the basis of this were found with, with the Merovingians, indeed. Um, so, the, the, around the court, naturally, uh, there would be certain officials, right? Certain officers, would say better, uh, that had uh, the peculiar tasks, naturally, of now dealing with the enormous amount of land that uh, the, the Franks had acquired. There were the mayors of palace that, as we've seen before, were these important officials were were very close to monarchic power and dealt with very serious situations in political military affairs. The counts uh, of of the palace uh, and the marshal, right? So um, the point here was to create a net of uh, officials that could refer directly to the king from the, the various uh, enormous amount of land that they had acquired uh, on a distance. Uh, so, as, as well as those antrustiones actually remaining at the king's side, others were posted in various provincial bases called centene, which me refers, uh, ideally at least, to the, uh, the name, uh, to the number 100, right? So, to the idea that, yeah, there was probably a decimal organization, we don't know much, but it was, it was actually very heterogeneous. The point is that uh, at a you know lower unit level, yes, probably the, these armies were organized on base of tents, just like you can see in the Anglo-Saxon England, pretty much everywhere um, uh, at this point. And were these sub officers, this, yeah, officers and even NCOs known as uh, centenari, for example, this is something you find easily even in in, in Longobard, Italy, and everywhere, right? This is not even very important. Uh, in itself, but it's real because, as we will see now, the, uh, the what really came to to matter now was the the local readiness more than how the army as uh, as a popular one was was organized for the same uh, reasons that we have talked about before. Um, so the royal antrustiones that are the men that effectively constitute the the king's army numbered in the thousands, right? We think uh, there, there's a lot of debate on this topics because we really don't know much, uh, but we think there were around five to, to ten thousand, right? And this is a maximum, which means that it's not literally all demand that the king could literally mobilize at, at every time, right? Um, they were still settled in a fashion for which even their participation had to be negotiated in some form. And some had were literally territorial guards in some form, like they they had to be tied to a territory to control it in the first place, uh, on behalf of the king. Um, and naturally, as we've seen, the nobility had antrustiones of their own, right? A practice which lasted into even to early Carolingian times. That uh, at one point made a bit of a more of a tabula rasa of these provincial um, units of this provincial regimes because they at that point were rooted in the, the lo with the, under the local lords and they they were kind of re-existing the same uh, Carolingian expansion in, in some occasions but right um, it's important to stress this elite that became the the, the normal military presence here in 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 the Merovingian Merovingian world. There were also naturally other troops. For example, we have the members of the Scara or, or Scariti, which were maniples of men that instead were, were always ready, especially to make war. Um, and uh, these troops were uh, to be found even in um, later times in the Carolingian army, and they were probably the, the very picked units uh, of the Merovingian War. They were the elite of the elite in some ways. They were military professionals. They were surely uh, provided their equipment also by the, the king, right? There is a redistributionary system in which even these troops are equipped, which was typical of, you know, both of Germanic and Roman tradition, especially in late antiquity, um, and that for this reason were also quite strongly tied to, to to the monarch or to the lord 
at the same time. Um, next to, to these troops, there were the local levies, right? So this mm, quite uh, blurry here number of, of troops that were technically eligible for military service, right? And next to these troops, in the 6th and in up to the early 7th centuries, and we will have to make a bit about them, um, the, the private mm, retinues of, of, of the monarch and sometimes even of the other magnates were supplemented by the descendants of Roman soldiers, the Leti or Militus, right? Um, the Leti, as you probably know, was uh, singular Letus, is a Latin word that in the late Roman Empire indicated those barbarians that had received the permission to settle on imperial territory receiving in property the occupied areas in exchange for the commitment to provide records for the Roman army. And um, in some cases uh, these troops had uh, in part been fundamentally part of the same Roman army proper, right? Uh, it depends uh, on which standards you, you want to take, but uh, in certain cases we know there were actually Roman units that when, in fact, Clovis conquered the Siagur's kingdom and other areas in Gaul were had remained there since Roman times, right? Um, and, and and particularly the latter were were in fact the uh, called as milites proper. Like the Latus would be more the um, the German guy who came there, settled, and received a sort of of, of a permission from local Roman authorities to to you know to, to settle down, but to provide military uh, service. Then there were the actual Roman soldiers that were there. Surely, and especially in Gaul, they were substantially Germanized, but there were many Gallo-Romans as well that were literally Roman soldiers by, by, all, by all standards, right? Not just like the Federati in general. Uh, naturally, these categories are very blurry, as you can understand, but we're talking sometimes of entire Roman units that joined the, uh, in this case, the Frankish army, but you can find them basically everywhere. Um, in in Europe, that you know, when when these invaders came, they, they simply passed from their side, and they they rendered their service. And th there is in this all um, a continuity, in fact, with the Roman military traditions that continues for a long time, not just through these units. We'll see it better when we talk about the cities now. But uh, I mean, it's it's quite evident that the uh, the army, for example, that Clovis employed to to conquer the majority of Gaul and uh, campaigning also in the south of 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 Gaul, uh, with this major uh, Roman cities that were besieged and and, and stormed uh, one by one quite effectively, well, owed a lot to the Roman military tradition, especially in siege warfare, that the barbarians were generally credited not to be very good at. And we know, in fact, even on uh, catapults of other um, engines that were of typical Roman um, tradition were there um, and that were reused by the Franks. And together with these troops that also had engineering competences, you know, um, a, a military education that in part the same Franks had received while serving the Romans. Uh, the Merovingians has started basically like that. Clovis' father was was a was a Roman soldier essentially, um, and uh, as well as a Germanic chieftain, right? So that there was, especially among um, certain clans, a, a quite um, long uh, tradition of of service in, in the Roman military. Uh, you find easily in the Notizia di Nitato many uh, Frankish units that uh, event that were serving in Gaul and that evidently at one point either reverted back to uh, to, to the, the Franks, but sometimes were maybe reabsorbed by the same Franks where they invaded uh, Gaul uh, eventually. But it was a, or a very progressive thing, so you can even you know distinguish the stages. But th that tells you how blended the, the wall the whole thing was. You have to think that when Clovis entered Gaul, I mean, all the military administration, depots, weapons, um, supply system was seized by the Franks, so there was a strong continuity 
um, in, in, in this regard that helped expand the same Merovingian power eventually uh, against the, their, their neighbors. And so this was what we can think as properly a, um, you know, the, the, the bulk of the Merovingian army, what really made the difference. You know, before Carolingian times and, let's say, between Carolingian times and, and, and late Roman times, let's put it in this way, what we can't call uh, in a narrow way the early mi Middle Ages proper, um, there's this idea that there was not much of a military dynamism, that everything was somewhat more primitive than it had been before, that uh, the the great change was definitely the, the Carolingian one. In part, the, the picture can be seen like this because there was effectively a contraction, less resources. Um, sometimes uh, the, the military reverted to kind of simpler uh, physiognomies. But in general, you have to think that the military professionalism, the even the logistical capabilities, the uh, um, polyorsetics, things like this, in, in part, always remained, and and these powers all had in this, especially in the royal clientels um, and, and retinues, uh, you know, a pretty good, solid knowledge of what all this thing wa was about, right? There, there was um, a part of society that was deputed to to war, right? And this is probably more evident than in any other place in Western Europe, exactly, in in the Merovingian one, because that's where um, the greatest continuity had existed with the past in this regard, and especially where politics and society made it more feasible to maintain essentially a bulk of more, say, semi-professional troops that were the army that would effectively participate to these continuous clashes uh, among the same Merovingian uh, that um, eventually you know, tore apart the same the same fabric of of the um, of the kingdom, but that at the same time were developing ever more e e towards a professional direction, right? And this is a bit like in later times. It, this this gets exasperated eventually with feudalism, right? That there is just an elite, and then the rest of the people is just not even good at fighting. This is this is the real point, right? It's not a matter of how you know what what weapon you have. It's really uh, an attitudinal. Um, Mm, uh, behavior, right? It's the idea that if you are someone who for generations as generations has just been plowing the land under someone's lord, who is instead the only guy who bears arms and does something else, well, you you even are relegated psychologically in a condition of inferiority that doesn't give you the confidence even to think to, 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 to make a change. And indeed, um, um, here, the, the picture is very complex because... Um, it is true that the, the the core of all the Merovingian resources was concentrated in in Gaul, right? But even these lands uh, were were very different, right? Um, the lands of Austra Austrasia, for example, were much more similar to to the ones of the Saxons or the Thuringians. There wasn't a great difference after all. Sometimes were the same people. The same Clovis matter was Thuringian, for example. Um, but if you look at the Salian or Saxon laws, what well, they were very, very similar in, ma in many ways. So there were areas that were kind of more stereotypically Germanic in the sense they were more warlike, where the freemen had a more political and military power, were less stratified. Instead, you you start f you find, especially in Gaul, this much more seigneurial and um, much more robust and structured. Um, uh, military system that revolves around these big clientels that rest on, on, on the shoulders of all these masses of, of peasants that are kept you know, at beta by this m uh, military elites and that work for them and that will become the, the, the feudal peasant, right? Um, but, and this is important because uh, at, at this point, the, the more time will go on and this process will, the more this process will be evident, but at, at the beginning it wasn't like so. Before we said how, for example, the the, the Frankish freemen that had settled in, in Gaul didn't quite fancy the idea that, you know, Clovis would become king of all the Franks, that they had to pay taxes to him. I mean, they were freemen, they were Germanic freemen, they had seized their land, that was uh, their God-given land, because they had seized them with arms, right? But... At the same time, this guy was really powerful. I mean, there, there is the episode of the Vase of Soissons that we've said many times, in which you show that um, 
Clovis really had taken the next step and had enforced it with with the power of arms, right? The idea that he was not the first among equals, like in the Germanic tradition. Uh, this is the guy who was asking, essentially, to carefully, wisely, but still asking to to give back uh, part of the loot to the bishop of, of, of Soissons that wanted this base back. And then this uh, Ger- Frankish warrior uh, that had the, the vase in front of him said, okay, you know what, you want this? And he crashes the vase in front of Clovis, like saying, you're no one to step over us as free men. Well, this guy, a year after, had uh, his skull split up like a cucumber by Clovis that told him in front of, in front of his corpse, saying, just like the base of Soissons. And, and that episode really tells you how strong was the the monarchical tendency already in mind of Clovis and the alliance with the church in that case, because Clovis eventually had collected all the you know ver- various pieces of the, of the vase and given it back very... Uh, respectfully to the bishop because he had understood what the, the potential laid in here. So the big problem was the idea of, of the mass of troops, like the the, the, the heriban, right? The idea that every freeman was eligible to be uh, mastered uh, in case of uh, of necessity, right? And and it was a privilege originally to to bear arms. So, but it's obvious that when the the Germans sedentarized, they they don't care very much, right? They have something else to leave, not just raiding and pillaging and, you know, they have surplus, they have land, they have slaves because they have occupied sometimes lands where they, everybody's, every Frank is a kind of a, a little lord because he has even maybe just 10 people under his his control and he, he they work for him and he, he has aggrandized his social status compared to what he was in Germany. Uh, so, also, the thing is more shaded. There are entire, as we were saying before, there were entire communities, uh, very large territories, like the one of Poitou, for example, that en masse, as Gallo Romans say, okay, we, we're, we're, we're Franks now. Like, we, we now we, we put ourselves in relation to the king as if we were uh, juridically Germanic. Yeah, it worked, right? This was very important because um, it was for the monarchy a chance to, to really create um, a bond with all these. Uh, communities and to to balance out the uh, the the competition, even some other the the few remain chieftains could could even think of. Um, so uh, the point is that the uh, initially the general levy of able-bodied free men could not be enforced even by Clovis, even if he had known definitely how to channel the Frankish forces to expand further and, and you know, conquering and seizing and pillaging and, and therefore exalting the, you know, the, 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 the fantasies of, the, of conquest of, of the Frankish people in general. But, you know, when eventually settled down, the story was, was very different. As we were just saying, the Franks initially were perceived like a people in arms, like the idea is that the army is the Franks, uh, theoretically. Um, Isidore of Seville, for example, talks about the Franks in terms like, you know, that they're so cold because even their name, Franks, is Freeman, is, but also, you know, kind of a military bold sense, is because of the how fierce they are, how their customs are so so ferocious. Sidonius Apollinaris describes the, the Salian Franks the, as since the, 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 the very first infancy, they are um they 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 fuel they they feed this um for for war that a passion that um, in other peoples you would find just at a mature age and that for if by chance the enemies overwhelm them for number or unfavorable position only death can um can take them down but n- not fear never fear they they remain standing undefeated, and their courage, we, we can say, survives to their own last breath. This is a somewhat stereotypical picture of the uh, German, of the, the ferocious uh, warrior that is so um, you know, used to, to warfare since uh, the young age that he can't basically even think outside of that. You know, the, the duty of every, every German fighter is to, to die. Um, in battle rather than, than retreating. These are things that the Romans were writing ever since 
uh, that they met um, these populations of the north and um, naturally we, we have to think that it, the, the Franks were were objectively some of the least Romanized populations after all. I mean Romanization is not really something that happens because of the geographical proximity to uh, the center of Roman culture, right? It's not that the Franks being on the northwestern frontier of Germany with the empire were necessarily more Romanized. The Franks were inhabiting areas that were also fairly depressed, right? They um, next to them were the, 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 the continental Saxons that were renowned, like they had a few per capita wealth, they were just very savage, very rough, very um, war oriented because that was the only way essentially to survive given there was a very few surplus, right? So, uh, albeit uh, kind of a literary cliche, but we don't have to exclude that, that these war bands, these troops, were really functioning with that mindset. We know them from their military style, we, we know them that there had been substantial contaminations that um, especially the elites had learned what the Roman army was, tactics, equipment, uh, etc. Um, we know that the Frankish chieftains at this time uh, that had already been settled as federati on the, on the uh, western uh, bank of the Rhine, the left bank of the Rhine, they, 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 they were sometimes buried with actual Roman weaponry with the idea that they were uh, proudly part of Rome in this sense, but the majority of the people was really that rough, right? They were still a very traditionalist after all. Uh, a striking characteristic of the Franks is, is probably together with the uh, continental Saxons and probably the, the Scandinavians were probably the, the, the Germans that made the least use of cavalry among the others, uh, which is kind of ironic considering that they would be the ones in the 8th century to develop the strongest indeed cavalry in um, in Europe, but something that was completely at a different level, the professional military force of heavily armored cavalrymen at this point had basically nothing to do with the ancient Germanic tradition, but in the mindset uh, they still retained this, and we have to think of the Franks as that rough, I mean we, we know that even for example, forget about their formal Christianization, we know it we have sources tell us that Franks at the beginning of the seventh century still m made um, uh, human sacrifices to pagan deities, but they they actually believed to be Christian formally, right? Um, we will deepen this topics on in dedicated videos, but it's evident that culturally speaking, in this private world with without a real public culture or education, what truly really rules is the sword, right? So the this combined to the uh, to the exaltation of having managed to uh, to take over Gaul and to rule it on behalf of the Emperor of Constantinople, Clovis had received actually the the vicariate of the Gauls. Uh, this um, ultra elitary um, uh, culture that they had developed with the locals, etc., created in the elite the, the idea that war was really all what mattered. Like, the, the, the Franks were not good at much, but they were the best at one thing, and this was war, right? And if you if this is your system of values, yeah, you maybe you will not be able to make a state function, but at least you really know how, how to slaughter who you find in front of you. And this is, in a nutshell, the history of the Franks throughout all time, right? Uh, a completely... Uh, unstable system that just a few enlightened monarchs uh, take, you know, Clovis was, was a pretty intelligent person, Dagobert, eventually the same, mm, especially Charlemagne and Louis de Pierce. I mean, these people had definitely realized that the state had to, to be the only and the possible answer to the continuity of, of, of Frankish leadership. It, it didn't happen because the whole system was rigged by this privatistic military and military horizon, which is what you find eventually in post carolingian Europe as you know, the, the creation in fact of, of the knightly class. That that was it was. They were there just to make one thing. War. These were professionals of war at three hundred and sixty degrees. And no, nobody else could do that. It was, as we've seen, a matter of land distribution. It was how their society was organized. It's not that necessarily the the Frankish uh, cavalrymen was the most warlike people. On the contrary, there were there were others, but they were the ones that 
that knew how to put in in to action a, a military system now that was in ants from especially from Carolingian times um, on, on a regular basis it was oriented just for making war on a large scale right this is this doesn't have to do specifically with the, with the Merovingians but the Merovingians had already set the basis for this to happen they had already essentially uh, progressed towards that direction and that's what would make the difference after all and it's exactly because of the lack of a public uh, authority that it's difficult at the beginning to put together the Herban as such right the Herban was technically to be led in the the decentralized system by the local comites right um, of counts commas singular count uh, so that freemen were obliged to perform such military service theoretically up to the age of 60 now um, until the second half of the 6th century basically we don't see anything like this uh, called because evidently the, 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 the people who had satchel at the beginning were uh, not responding to, to the king this this happened also in other during other Germanic invasions that yeah the, the, the people occupies the territory but there is yet a monarchy to be formed right and therefore every group does more or less what they want they refuse to be under certain command that they, they they refuse it they have antibodies against this in Germanic uh, culture and the rest of the local militias are not quite functional right especially for for a military campaign proper um, this areas like Italy like Gaul had been over time kind of demilitarized right culturally by by the Romans you know th these were areas that you know Italy Gaul they were place of important warrior cultures that during however the the Roman Empire had essentially gentrified right the warriors transformed themselves into farmers into merchants then eventually they they didn't want to fight anymore and therefore they delegated to others they paid money for mercenaries for in progressively social crisis over the centuries crisis of the third century etc so this middle classes basically um, decline and they they revert to, to, to peasantry that is just tied to this major um, as land estate owners that are the senators right the guys who have their own military regimes as primates now and that and the rest of the population is kind of uh, a very low uh, military potential if you want um, not so excessively meaning that of course communities especially cities had their own valuable militias but that's still not a professional force of troops you can use all the time right and also need to be used locally in fact um, generally these obligations also uh, about the levy included maintenance of and defense of fortresses roads uh, bridges and guard duties right so um, these were systems that were normally performed locally so that these guys would would not go out there for war some, somewhere else I don't know from from Australia to uh, to Aquitaine right it, it would have been useless in many ways because they were not uh, ready for it um, but it's important that the local uh, seigneurial dominations use this um, this community to to effectively control um, uh, the land and to tie them to to them. So it's the beginning of the seigneurial system. And the military service at first didn't even involve the service of all freemen, right? Because the poor were generally exempt, right? And this was typical of other uh, Romano-Germanic uh, levy systems, right? And so much that this this thing increases over time because the levy was reduced only to one man from each family. And the more it goes on, you even find these farmers that are individually too poor, so they they make a sort of consortium to just one out of three or out of four went toward the other paid for for their for his equipment, right? But still, this was a a, a massive cost for an early medieval economy. So actually. Uh, it was much more functional, in fact, to have this smaller but, you know, more reliable military retinues that uh, had all the, the interest to, to stick to you because you were the guy with money uh, 
and while the rest of the population would be mm, exempted uh, and they would for military service proper but they would at least work for producing the resources to to make use your revenues in a more professional uh, fashion nevertheless there were important punishments for those who didn't pr present um, to to the army and that had the duty uh, to do it in fact um, this could be even punished with death right uh, although uh, it usually resulted instead in yet a heavy fine based on the defaulter's social standing and this was a very heavy right i still don't know why whether it was a uh, uh, because you know if you when you make high sanctions it's, it's not always clear whether it's because you you think that uh, many people escape this control which is possible or also because you want really you can use iron fist as 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 you want really it's usually about the first but a fine for example of 60 solidity occurs in the early 9th century so later times now but that's still meaningful it didn't change much and and you have to think that at the time 40 solidity would have supplied a man with complete arms and armor and war horse from the recruitment system so this means that you know if you were just a you know an average uh, Gallic uh, peasant you know you you would have been cry you would have been sold into slavery at that point because you would have you didn't have the money to pay that and even for an aristocrat 60 solidity was uh, a quite consistent amount of money um, and yet this was the highest fine was payable by those who owned five pounds worth of chattels those with three pounds paid thirty solidity with two pounds ten solidity and with one pound five solidity and we don't know how long the service lasted um, it was probably just seasonal at the beginning right meaning that the, the peasant levy yeah, couldn't serve more than a few months but that would have been already pretty stretched uh, as a time hence the necessity also of picking just uh, someone out of the, the whole population to bring him to, to, to war uh, properly um, made the maximum maybe it was six months consider also that um, I mean northern France is start being you know already kind of northern Europe I mean it's cold also there are certain climatic uh, problems in um, putting up a military expedition but more realistically we can think that this system of recruitment and especially I would say in Frankish Gaul didn't quite uh, work um, because um, it, it was much more convenient to squeeze the local resources and to pay professionals of war rather than forcing peasantry to to serve it still did happen right but the performance was much more limited than this it was sometimes even just a few tens of days right um, Gregory of Tours writes that after the siege of Comminges uh, from the side of the King Guntram in 584 quote was published by the 15 judges an edict to condemn those who had belated to present to this expedition so uh, we think that there was um you know probably a political thermometer that uh, influenced the way um you know that this participation this military service could could be enacted right strong kings for example in enforced the levying of, of taxation on lands which franks had acquired in addition to those assets which they they held in return for their military service and which were exempt from tax right this was the concept the idea is that if the frankish warrior in his family's descendants had settled on, on on a piece of land and and these were more than individuals actually entire communities that were conceived as such well um, that land just like in the vassalitic beneficiary system was e equated in a certain sense to a piece of royal Mm, property that the king had allowed for these guys to settle in but in exchange for for military service but it's evident that as we're seeing now that you know it's much easier to to make these communities pay than obliging them to go to war especially all together but the problem is that many Franks didn't want to hear about this they said we are theoretically free right so also politically speaking we decide whether we want to participate to war or not and, and sure uh, you can't tax us instead um, 
this happened like the the royal exactors came to, to certain lands to to ask for money and some Franks as Gregory of Tours writes uh, rebelled to the royal uh, exactors and even more interesting at the death of a king um, the tax collectors were usually assaulted so that this makes you understand that uh, from one side the what was still the power of these communities in the early Merovingian times um, and how the, the royal officials in this sense entered um, in a situation was pretty ambiguous because the idea of account for example was the major you know the the the, the Merovingian kingdom was all split the, divided into several districts that were the, the count is proper right where the commons would rule on behalf of the king that, that was the the medium between royal power and local communities and, and and this guy was in charge literally of of everything like just like the Goths and the Burgundians the counts have the uh, especially ruling from the cities uh, in Gaul uh, was a military chief uh, responsible for public order was a judge a tax collector administrator right so this is a typically romano-germanic um, figure um, in many ways well the local freemen do not like this especially the one of germanic horses but those also those the gallo romans and together with other germans may also that uh, had enough power to contrast this officials would do it right and uh, the fact that they could essentially assault um, these officials um, over time uh, tell especially when a king died it really tells you how unstable the same Merovingian monarchy after Clovis was, was soon became right because uh, there was no certainty of what would happen uh, when the king died what it meant is that is their uh, his sons would start fighting among each other so it was surely war so you know all the royal administration that had been in place before would have changed or would have been major strains and therefore it was better to assault this off officials that by the way held probably you know also some you know that th they held that they lived in some structures some palaces and some with depots of stuff where they could kept uh, money and goods and, and weaponry right so um, it was very very difficult to maintain in place what Clovis had on the base of a Roman model had tried to extend with these comital figures right it was a quite um, a troubled um, picture, right? If you read Gregory of Tours, uh, you realize that th I mean the light motif of the story is that uh, well, Clovis was uh, so good; he was the guy who had converted Christianity, was the, that had set everything fine. But uh, Gregory of and, and then his sons eventually were, you know, starting to kill each other because they were degenerated. But it's an attack to secular. Uh, political culture, right? Gregory of Tours, as a bishop, in fact, um, that also was, however, into secular politics in the sense that in Gaul, that was the role of bishops having their, their own power on their own. He he looks at the the Frankish counts that at this point are still kind of ethnically um, divided, or at least you know that they still retain this germanic warlike heritage and he depicts them as essentially as children like of people who can be reconciled with the words of the bible uh etc but the, you know that the day after was they would go back to you know kill each other and that the, there was no way you could you you could change your mindset on uh on the short run and and there are there are stories of a lot of violence of, of, of uh, violence of cruelties and naturally it's a biased um, account uh, but also probably a very vivid and somewhat realistic picture of what um, Merovingian goal ha had become at that point and um, it's important because surely you know if a Frankish count could uh, tell his version right of the story which they usually didn't because they couldn't write um, quite simply because once again the only thing they knew about literally was making war Right, that that was literally the only thing they knew, and they were conceived for in their. Um, but if they could express uh, their their opinion, that but we would probably see even a, you know, logic in what was going on. I mean, even in all of these um, uh, wars of this destruction, I mean, that there was still a logic that we have to make an effort to understand from a uh, 
uh, not necessarily from a fully rational point of view, but at least from from the idea that there was a relation of power in there that had to be settled in some ways. That surely, uh, in the absence of a former uh, centralized administration, was objectively quite quite difficult to do. Um, so consider also the <clears throat> the geographical dimension. Um, it seems f that the the base of recruitment could be very very wide. Um, Gaul was definitely a very interconnected system. I mean, Gaul was a, uh, was, at this point, was the richest land in Europe. I mean, in terms of amount of agricultural resources, this surpassed uh, Italy. Um, it had well, Gaul was, as you know, was pretty solidly Romanized. It had it had actually even since pre-Roman times this uh, very uh, rational distribution of settlements with uh, over which the Romans had developed further. You know, quite. The walled towns, as we will see now, very important roads surrounded by the countryside. It's also fairly easy to to control France in this regard because there are not, especially this this the Atlantic side of it, uh, this three fourths of it basically. Um, it, it, it you know it, it's fairly flat, it's fairly uh, fertile, it's well connected. It has those key um, cities that control wide amounts of, of of land, and and that's where the struggle would revolve around. Also, it was rich, it was full of clientels, of, of elites that contacted each other at a distance. So, uh, the political and military game was very, very, um, very vivacious, let's say. Um, they, the, the communities that could, would and could participate um, uh, on a long-range uh, struggle against all these various Merovingian princes that would uh, fight against each other all the time... Uh, Definitely contributed to to the extension, the the um, the strengthening of these clientel relations and how they they could interact with each other. Um, for example, against the Bretons, King Kilperic uh, summoned the inhabitants of Touraine uh, and Poitou, uh, of the region of uh, Le Mans and of Anjou, and against the men of Poitou, Guntram instead used the one of the Touraine and of the Berry. Um, also, Gregory of Tours tells us um, that Kilperic punished with uh, banishment right, the peasants and the young servants of the cathedral because they didn't have presented to arms. It's very meaningful uh, information because he also adds that, that at that point um, it was not a custom that these people would be subject to a public service, right? When you, when you say public service here, you have to, to understand that naturally the Merovingians were um, claiming uh, to have a public power as kings, right? But the, the truth is naturally that their their power was uh, based on how, ma how many troops they mobilized. Um, and therefore, they could extort this service or its um, monetary or natural goods e equivalents, even if the local communities had not, you know, privily used. Right. And the point here is that these people were not. We know it from um, another passage that uh, Gregory writes later that it's not that these people were being called to arms because weren't. Ha weren't accustomed to be called to arms because they were too poor, for example, but because they depended on a church. Now, this is a very uh, important thing because here Gregory is uh, naturally from the side of the uh, of the clergy. Um, I mean, not necessarily in the narration, but I mean in general, right? So it was seen as an important, I mean, the fact that I mean, the church was legitimately thinking of itself of, of something different. It even didn't belong to a secular power that had certain prerogatives, uh, privileges, and that, as we've seen, played a very, very important role, even at the royal level. Right. So this was seen as a as an unusual thing to do, and definitely a quite upsetting one from a clergy perspective. But um, we have to remind, as we were saying before, that bishops actually owned an enormous amount of, of, of power, of land, uh, of slaves, of, of soldiers. So, I mean, th there, was a, there was a lot of ecclesiastically owned territory that the Merovingians were looking at and saying, how oh, we have to squeeze even that one, right? And at this point, though, uh, the weaker the, the monarchy was becoming, the, the more difficult it was 
was feasible, difficulty was feasible, because, you know, these bishops were, in a way, even better rooted in their power than, than the Franks, you know, especially the fact that they relied on fortified cities where the, where the seat of the diocese was, was an important thing. Think about siege warfare here. It was a big problem, right? In, in early medieval times, walled cities of Roman origin you know, were, were fit to, to besiege. It took an enormous amount of resources. The systems were still also running out. We would succeed in effectively in um, seizing um, ecclesiastical land uh, in, at the beginning of the 8th century would be Charles Martel that in fact would be the one that with all this land managed to boost this vassalatic beneficiary system at the point of you know making it uh, of carving out of it a, a dramatically efficient military machine and at that time by the way it wasn't just you know like the evil Frankish uh, horsemen that arrived in the land of the poor little priest who was just plugging his, his vegetable garden. You know, we're talking about massive estates that these bishops had mm, occupied during the period of vacancy of Merovingian royal power and that technically actually be had belonged to, to, to the kings, right? And now they were taken back. Charles Martel in that sense was you know, uh, was crucified by, by um, uh, ecclesiastical uh, historiography but actually saved great part of, you know, he was what that allowed the, the the Carolingians to to strengthen their power to to go forward, uh, but let's say that uh, in already in Merovingian times, in, in the toughest moments, especially at the beginning uh, of the period when the, the monarchy was stronger, you know, even the ecclesiastical lands were were seized in some uh, cases and demanded for military service. Um, in the decades around 600, significant social change, however, had taken place, centering upon a change in the nature of aristocracy, which increased its local power in a period of royal minorities. Um, the, the Merovingians did some of the most horrible things for the sake of continuing the lineage, and there was not important, like they had made it to, to create a sacral dynasty, Reason for which, you know, if you were son of of a, of a former king, like all your uncles wanted to to kill you, and the Merovingians did a horrible thing you, that didn't happen in other kingdoms because of this, including you know breaking children's head over a rock just because they were you know sons of their brothers that were they wanted to take them out of the succession. So this was a really big. Um, a crippling factor of the solidity of the kingdom, like it, it's effectively what brought the whole thing down on the long run. Uh, it was a very violent society, I mean, a very violent one, and um, the, the there was a transformation, though, also in in the perception of what the nobility was in this regard, um, because as the um, royal dynasty was growing weaker uh, the rest of, of the nobility was structuring kind of a, an identity on their own of noble a group of noble lineages that at this point were um, identifying especially by the early 8th century uh, in Austria this is northwestern France essentially um, with the term frank right the idea that being a frank at that point was um, was a matter of you know, of identity, of uh, of pride, of, of of status, right? Well, the rest of the people were stereotypically thought of, you know, non-noble, hence inferior, hence uh, in every possible way, right? So there was this brutal uh, impoverishment of the, of the big masses that at this point didn't quite uh, serve much from a military point of view, especially in Gaul, um, and this robust, strong, well equipped and powerful elites that were now playing the game um, as we've seen even in, in the place of the same kings. Um, in this process there was a sort of further um, territorialization in the organization of military power and you see the rise of great military uh, clientels um, that were revolving in fact around what would become uh, through the commendatio, the, the vassalitic beneficiary system, is the relation with the land. For example, the antrustiones that we have seen before um, were 
beginning to be called Leude, for example, like the Let. I mean, there was this idea that the the elite, uh, the military elite, w was um, enfeffed basically. They would, they would be given land in exchange for military service, and that this would become basically standard for for military service in the first place. Naturally, these people had, as we've seen, the local militias. Um, to, to to support them in case of uh, you know need of emergency, but at this point it was really the embryo of what become Carolingian cavalry that was developing and taking over, right? Um, and we have two passages from the Chronicle of Fredegarius that show us the the role. Then, for example, one. Um, has to do with the king of Sigebert, who ordered to all the Leudi of Austrasia, so the eastern part of Francia, to reach the army. The inhabitants of the counties um, of his kingdom be of beyond the Rhine, right, so from the German side, that to come to, to reach him. And the other quote is uh, at the time of Dagobert, uh, the beginning of the 7th century, that in order to ensure the peace for his own succession, because his, his kingdom had been fairly good, because he was, in fact, lucky to remain without siblings, if without brothers, and you know, kind of recompacted the thing a bit, but it is that obviously didn't last, he ordered to all the Leuti that he uh, was governing in Austrasia to present to the army. What does these two uh, passages mean? Well, it means quite clearly here that uh, there were quite long-range um, military clienteles that were basically used to summon consistent amount of troops, and especially this settled, let's say, m military semi-professionals, right, that were tied... Uh, by several relations to two kings and two other men of power and that had to intervene in case in case of war and even from fairly far away because here we're looking at the lands of Austrasia that are substantially far they're hundreds of kilometers away from from the center of uh, of Gaul um, and even beyond the Rhine right so here we're to talking about several hundreds of kilometers over which these troops were, were called to serve. So you understand here how, and it, this is still fairly early in time, um, how this military service was already kind of geographically extended, and it, it recalls quite much what you could still you, you could see uh, in in uh, Carolingian times too, uh, where the, the system was much more implemented, enhanced, but it, it substantially was working in the same way, right? When trouble arrives or people summoned from all your clients scattered all over uh, the empire to, to come to to support you. Um, so the transformation that occurred in the um, 7th century has to do even with um, with cities. Cities has to mm, be considered as the one of the m most important feature of Frankish Gaul, right? As we've seen before, they were literally the center of power in many areas, especially actually in, in, in the south of France, so not in Francia proper, but still in lands that were uh, importantly uh, involved into Merovingian policy. Um, Northern France, also Austrasia, were a bit different in the sense that the center of power was... Uh, I mean, all these kings had residences in the cities, but... Um, the, the core of their power was actually the countryside. And this would remain the case historically in the Middle Ages. So, like in the in France and Germany, there were lands that were properly the land of the forest. Like there are entire communities that live detached from the cities that do not live in there. Um, if you look at the Merovingians, they had this massive household uh, in the countryside. They ruled from there. Cities were very, very important for for public power for collecting taxes for administration and the reason being that their inhabitants were fundamentally uh, the the ancient largely the ancient roman inhabitants that whose elites had uh, you know solid education they had competences practice of government of administration and that especially in early times 
played a very important part um, in the army. They had militias on their own, right? And yet most of them were uh, called to perform uh, defense duties. Like they even, you know, talking about Roman cities in Gaul, they had sometimes uh, city rings uh, uh, of walls that were also multiple kilometers long and in order to to defend that for example in case of siege well you have to to commit thousands of troops um, and that's what most of their fort would be directed to but there was also uh, uh, sometimes an employment of campaign well the importance of, of cities uh, declines together if you want with the same Merovingian monarchy right with the, it's as if uh, Clovis um, r rode the wave of this last period of prosperity of late antiquity eventually uh, in the mid 6th century this thing starts dying out if you look at even the range of Merovingian campaigns you r realize that it's always shorter than uh, ever less troops are are mobilized that evenly resources were running out whether we don't know if it was because of the of the plague of the clima climatic changes because simply these territories had been squeezed too much right but there is a sort of uh, localistic dimension that increases over time um, and cities decline in, in the same level right the, the city especially in, in the north of France north of Gaul um, tends to to die out more more easily in the south it continues on right and that's also in fact the center of power of Occitania that will last for quite a long time in the middle ages the northern culture is much more rural and uh, in this sense even more seigneurial and um, and, and landed and um, let's say we can't say landed because even in the south there were major land estates but let's say it was less civilized in some ways, it was more military in nature because it really belonged to a world that was based on brutal um, r ratios of strength and, and not kind of more sophisticated policy in some way. I mean, I know it's a kind of a rough theory, but it, it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, and you can see the change um, in terms of also of, of the military duties that the cities were called to perform. Uh, in fact, the last reference to a civitas, as it was known in Latin, um, seems uh, as a levy, like the civitas levy, the mil urban militia, seems to be the account of the treachery of the men of mines, who began the Frankish army's flight in the battle against the Thuringians in 639, which is also not quite of a good um, presentation, right? These troops evidently were quite different from plausibly not just the the, the core of semi-professional troops that that regularly composed the core of the of the Merovingian armies but also from maybe the, the average um, you know Romano-Germanic uh, farmer that maybe was kind of you know still also more exposed to certain environments more more warlike um, uh, tradition um, the same story also refers to a contingent from Saint camping hundreds of miles to the east of their homeland. Um, but a passage in Fredegar's Chronicle for 631 points the way to future developments, which intends that these um, militias were essentially falling out of, of importance overall um, uh, in this context, right? So, mm, how was this military service eventually uh, also regulated, right? How, well, the uh, armies in general were assembled on, on, on this m masters that occurred uh, traditionally uh, on the 1st of March. They were called the March Field, right? Uh, they were assemblies that in a certain sense had still resembled this old idea of the um, of the assembly of the freemen, right, of all the people in arms. This is something you find in many other uh, countries, I mean, theoretically even royal 
lows, I mean, or better, you know, the, the lows of the people were emanated in presence of the army of the king. Uh, this is quite evident in Longobard, Italy, also in other places. In, in Merovingian Gaul, it was probably more complicated. It was really, really more a matter of of a big logistical system that was being developed further. This will be particularly even especially in Carolingian times where it's kind of better documented and we're talking about larger masses of troops by that time but the idea that all these huge territories had to be controlled by an effective military force that had to be surveilled in its efficiency and kept uh, functional over time was, was a big deal right? Um, because it was also a way to test political um, loyalty, right? How many people would attend uh, the master? How, uh, you know, what were the interests in there? And this is still even in Carolingian times, right? Oh, theoretically, everybody had to participate as much as they could, but naturally, m much less people would participate. Why? Well, because maybe they were uh, were not interested, were opposed to this the decisions, were maybe simply uh, rebelling uh, enemies of. Uh, of the monarch um, of these various chanks that were constantly fighting uh, against each other and this mm, march field is seen um, throughout all the, the 6th century it goes on right and um, the mm, they probably had origin both not just in the Germanic tradition but also in the Roman army right that this is still the Roman army goal was some and had to, you know, you'd be tested in its efficiency, had to be maintained um, uh, in many ways, and it was really vital to keep also the direct link between rulers and the broad based rank and file of their armies, right? Mediated only by royal officers, like if you're a king. And, and you are, you know, you're risking a lot, right? You have even to, to ensure that there is a loyalty uh, to you, that you have an effective control. And you have royal officials scattered, sometimes even hundreds of kilometers away. And you have to test whether these people are responsive or maybe they're building a scenery uh, on their own out there, which would, would which happened, telling the truth, and it ended up happening so that the, these... Um, counts, etc., would simply, you know, on the longer run, first of all, they would see their service as hereditary, right? This is another very important thing, right? That these guys didn't consider themselves, once again, as public officials. They felt themselves bonded to the to the king, but also they they saw this the, this office as an honor that could even be transmitted to the, their sons and that had a, a territorial uh, character. So this slowly transformed in the uh, in certain prerogatives that saw the territorialization of of, of, of local officials as lords on uh, powers on their own right um, so yeah these were political occasions more than just strictly military ones and if you think about it in uh, in Carolingian times it was become not the, the camp of March uh, but the camp of May right uh, the idea of the Campus Mars is literally uh, March is because it comes from from Mars, right? From from the god of war, um, and in um, you know in southern Europe where it's warmer, um, for example, the, the Longobards mustered in in March, literally. That's that's what the army was called. In in, in Carolingian times, you had to wait for May uh, because it was colder, but also because the Carolingians in that point had developed a consistent amount of of cavalry forces that that needed uh, enough logistical capability i mean supplies and all these horses had to be fed to, they had to graze they needed grass so they couldn't go when it was too cold um, and we can imagine that even in merovingian times it was probably um, a, a shift over time uh, as as long as the, the the army transformed from this ideally kind of uh, you know, typically Germanic to substantially a, a seigneurial, um, lordly, um, uh, Romano-Germanic one. Um, and it's also obvious that uh, as long as the Merovingian monarchic power uh, fragmented, that these assemblies lost in, uh, if anything, in size, not necessarily in, in importance at a local level, but they weren't this major feat that... But always 
looking at Merovingian history even in the moment of decline, you've got to admit that these guys were able to mount up substantial expeditions, even on a long range scale. And it's pretty interesting to look at this because it was never a kind of a, a strategically decisive move most of the times. Um, and everything was naturally a, a political matter, first of all. But th there were important armies, and even if you look at what the Carolingians will be able to do, uh, you know, starting from just Cologne and a few lands around it, to, to seize all, the, all, once again, to reunite all of this Merovingian domains, well, that is done through a you know, logistical system of a world that, this is probably the most important thing, that is completely oriented towards war. Like, th th even at a local level, from an infrastructural point of view, start finding depots, you, um, you know, structures, um, you know, lands and fortifications and th th that are all working, essentially, for that specific uh, goal, right? So even if you look at, for example, Carolingian times, the, the, the pretty damn efficient logistical system that allowed sometimes tens of thousands of troops to to shift with in incredible efficiency from one side to another of Europe, we're talking even about thousands of kilometers, well, you realize that in the absence of a central state that had, could organize that, it was all about local vassals, it was all about these pre-existing structures that uh, were oriented towards, you know, supplying the army and, and giving this uh, this fuel for, for everything, without which, you know, nothing could, could be even... Uh, mounted up, so uh, it was particularly important. Then there is another element that is um, crucial in this picture, is and that we were talking about at the beginning of the video. That is, that the Franks effectively, the Frankish kingdom proper is just Neustria and Austrasia, right? Then there are all these other massive chunks like Aquitaine, Burgundy, Alamannia, uh, even Bavaria. Um, you know, and eventually, as long as you know, the empire expanded, other areas, even larger and even more far than that. And in Merovingian times, these are controlled by figures like usually the, the they, uh, they were named as Erzog or Dux, uh, Germanic and Latin, respectively. So these were figures of great prestige that were sent since the beginning of, of the empire to rule over the subjected populations. I mean, Clo the, the, the Franks conquer Aquitaine, the Burgundians, the Alamanni. The, the, these peoples are even, cr they, they're literally crushed in battle, right? So there is a pretty brutal way in which Merovingian rule is extended. I mean, really brutal. Right? You don't have to think these guys were, the Franks were, were very, very nasty. You can, you can see that. They, they were uh, extremely confident in the divine mandate of, of their of their conquest. There was nothing could put um, uh, itself in between them and, and their their goals and they, they were right. And there were massive transformations of these local societies. But at the same time it was impossible to control with iron fists th these peoples that sometimes maintain a kind of a, uh, even a military vitality on their own, right? Um, the, the, the Burgundians, the Alamanni maintain a sort of um, of ethnical um, character that at, at that point was not typically the, the the one of their of their origins. Now it was Frankicized, right? There were lots of Frankish noblemen that were sent there to rule over these peoples. But over time, the same Frankish rulers eventually, you know, they intermarried with the local elites, etc. They they began kind of a laman, like kind of Burgundians. Where uh, even in Carolingian times, was in this sense the the problem of reincorporating these territories, sometimes there were brutal massacres of the, you know, exterminations of the local aristocracy. Think about the Alamanni, what, what, what happened to them, and their elites. So, um, but uh, on, on a regular basis, this lands would be controlled by the Merovingians through these officials that were in charge of the military administration of all these chunks, right? Um, and that weren't quite different, in fact, from in size from Austrasia or Neustria, for example. So uh, there were resemblances uh, between their military organizations, but th they brought a sort of external element because these people, well, by large, were not Franks. They were 
other uh, peoples. Um, and naturally, the frontiers were also quite blurry. Uh, think about the Bavarians that oscillated between the Franks that had actually created them as a duchy on their own, and the Longbirds, right? So um, there is a, a, you know, a, kind of a multicultural character of, of the Merovingian armies that it will be even more accentuated in Carolingian times of troops that were came literally from everywhere, sometimes even picked elite troops. Uh, taken by the various, uh, you know, the local elites that would be sent as far as, uh, you know, you know, really easily. There were um, Longbird Gazindi, for example, in Carolingian times, who were sent to fight in in Saxony. Right? They, they, there was a quite of a quite interesting military exchange that was wasn't probably devoid even, uh, you know, of some strategical value in itself. You now these people uh, began to even to be more slightly more closer uh, to even to literature some some red vegetius you know there was um evidently the perception that this thing i mean the carolingian empire especially from a logistical point of view is not something you can invent from a day to another it was the franks were f very competent in their affairs they were they were great organizers right charlemagne had a a, a true logistical talent of you know really the massive fists that were here crossing the Alps besieging cities for nine months it was very hard uh, think about the Danubian campaign against the Avars with all the, the supplies via the, the river I mean it w these were massive works for the time and it, it they entailed a concerted effort of all these elements so it was vital for a functional empire empire to to work on, on these bases, right? So uh, I would like to conclude with uh, a reflection on the development of um, cavalry during this time, because we usually, I think we never f fully addressed in Schwerpunkt the, um, the development of Carolingian cavalry, right? And this crucial moment is, is especially the 8th century, from which things start really to take a turn uh, at, a, at a speed that uh, was unprecedented, right? But in this sense, we tend to forget the Merovingians a bit, because we feel like, oh, well, this guy's failed, you know, the, the, the thing crumbled and it didn't work anymore, so they were bad, right? But actually, there is a, a much greater continuity uh, between the Merovingians and the Carolingians than is usually credited, the Carolingians were partly responsible even of, of this prejudices to spread because they naturally needed to to emphasize the legitimacy of their action on the basis of the incompetence of the Merovingian kings, the roi fanon as they're called in French, I mean so these uh, idler kings that that actually were you know not that bad in them most of the time. I mean, th there are important historiographical implications in here that we, we there is no need to, to to discuss them now. But definitely for the development of cavalry, we have to look far back here at, at how it happened, because especially if you consider that the Franks were the guys who seemingly made least use of cavalry among all the other you know, most of the Germans that, that, that settled in the um, the Roman lands, right? You must understand that you know something happened, happened, and we have explained it before, right? It's really the, uh, a matter of land distribution, of how the system was implemented, and we can photograph though the um, the increase in importance of cavalry in in, in Merovingian times. Why we have a very few evidence, like uh, early Middle Ages are terribly fascinating, uh, and unfortunately they are also so scarcely documented but there are a few mm, like think that we don't understand even about the tactical development of these battles think that even in Carolingian times the this, this single battle that has a tactic a known tactical development is the battle of Zuntal there was also a Carolingian defeat by the way against the Saxons and out of that literally we don't know anything about these battles like because the normal thing is that that guy arrived, uh, that guy too, and they 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 battled and one died, and because God had decided that the other guy had to win, that that's literally it. And this is kind of frustrating because, especially also in Carolingian times, there were 
even think about Nithard, these um, literally military men who, who started writing something, but when they wrote, they still stuck to the normal historiographical model at the time, and they, they, d they wouldn't tell you what was going on in the battle, even if they actually took part in it. Because they were all thinking all about you know the skies and what God had designed it will throw all this stuff, and, and, you, and that's also very meaningful because it tells you much about the mindset of these people as well. Sometimes it's even more important than uh, knowing what, how a battle actually happened because it's uh, after all, as we know from from Clausewitz, it's, it's war is a uh, you know matter of social uh, excuse me moral forces primarily, right? Um, so, for most of Merovingian times, um, um, infantry was the um, the usual form of military service, right? Uh, cavalry existed, of course, and even the early Franks had cavalry, just they had it in fewer numbers and generally weaker than others. Uh, not in warlike temperament. I mean, even think about Caesar that had met these tribes on, on the Rhine, and they had horses that sucked because they were small and, you know, ugly. And um, and he gives them uh, the Roman knights horses, and, and these Germans make marvels against the Gallic cavalry. So, actually, these guys definitely knew how to go on horseback, um, but... You know, they, they didn't have much of a collective training, that's the point. You know, they were individually, they were like, they fought like crazy, but as we all know, in front of collective training, you lose, right? <laughs> that's that's the point. So what happened progressively is, is throughout all these times, there's a transformation, it takes time, right? In The, the, the Frankish army begins to to. to to develop further cavalry, for all the reasons that we have described today, right? Uh, social certification primarily, but also this long-range uh, connections. And this is an important improvement because if you think that the starting point was in in Roman Gaul, right? And we know that in, in late Roman times, cavalry is the queen of battles, right? Here, I give for granted that you know perfectly well what's the the timing and development of cavalry throughout all the the ancient world um, in, in Europe and the Mediterranean infantry is the decisive arm right the, the cavalry becomes the decisive arm just in uh, essentially the, the the mid 12th century to the beginning of the 14th century eventually like the, there are kind of sinusoidal trends in this but you know the, the prevalence of the tactical decisiveness of cavalry is something that has in, in Western Europe, uh, you know, quite a quite a specific timeline. And and what you see here is that uh, in by 626, which is fairly early, right, there is a first witness of what is apparently um, a decisive use of cavalry. In battle against the the old Saxons, right? This this happened on a river, um, where uh, the the basically the Franks charged through the river and they defeated the Saxons with cavalry, right? And and this is regarded as you know the, the evidence that fundamentally cavalry was taking a a, a more important uh, turn than it had been before, right? Um, if I made that video on the Battle of Strasbourg in which you see that, for example, even light Germanic cavalry and infantry mixed together on the Alemannic left wing had defeated even Roman cataphracts on the right wing. I mean, cavalry wasn't... Uh, the Roman use of cataphracts in late antique was <laughs> in antiquity wasn't that successful in the first place, but just for telling you how effectively, um, you know... if. It's simple as that. I mean, if you don't have a feudal society, you don't have a strong cavalry. It's it's literally that simple, right? Um, so what is going on in here is that just after not even 150 years, uh, or maybe exactly uh, 150 years in this case, from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, you have a first uh, evidence of decisive use of cavalry, which which is not standard. I mean, cavalry is not the size of even if you look at the Battle of Zuntal, we were saying before, more than one century afterwards of the Carolingians, this uh, Rhineland uh, cavalry levies sent to deal with the Saxon rebellion get 
I mean, they get slaughtered and butchered down by the, by, by, by the uh, Saxons on, on, on foot, right? Because at this point, this bulk of sturdy, uh, you know, determined infantrymen still can't hold on an adequate terrain cavalry, and it will be so for, for a long time, even Hastings, right? If if the Anglo-Saxons had not broken the ranks, I mean, the Norman read essentially French cavalry, Western Frankish cavalry, was broken, right? Um, was retreating, so uh, it's, it was a ruse essentially. So cavalry is is not decisive, but you find this first element of of decisiveness that was quite rare for the time standards, and it's not a coincidence. It's happening in this context. So what it means is that ever since the Frankish settlements, definitely th this local society had developed further probably on a trend that had already began before, right? Um, towards the the empowerment of cavalry in a way or in another. Um, and we have to see, for example, in the 6th century, there are records of city levies that sometimes served as mounted, which is very interesting because uh, you have even citizens, so not just, you know, uh, the Frankish rural lord, stereotypically speaking, but it's probably not even so sensed to to you know detach the two things categorically. But let's say you know, as we've seen before, the city militias were declining in general, and, and yet they could provide even them mounted troops, not just infantry. And um, as we've seen before, we there had been Frankish cavalry units in the Notizia di Unitatum operating in the Roman army in the late antique uh, times but between the, the, the 4th and the 5th century uh, and uh, the from, we know that from 755 so we are we are already in full Carolingian times the march field was even postponed until May for the reasons of foraging as we were saying before and in 758, the king Pippin uh, changed the tribute paid by the old Saxons from cattle to horses, which is indicative of the growing importance of the horse in Frankish warfare. Remember, this was actually already quite a thing the times of Pepin's father, Charles Martel. Um, and there is, d in fact, this debate, even if you look at the Battle of Tours, also known as Poitiers, 732, of the Franks against the Arabs, that how important was actually cavalry at that point, because uh, we know, apparently, that the majority of Franks clearly fought as infantry, and they were even at very tough infantry. There is this picture of the Northmen as a wall of ice, literally, in, in the Chronicles, that would stand the, uh, the Arab uh, onslaught, the uh, and uh, and however they pursued the fleeing Arabs on on horseback, right? So um, the question is probably a bit um, senseless because you know probably even many of those Franks that met the Arabs on on foot were actually cavalrymen themselves, and this this is typical, right? You find it easily, easily, even I don't know in Norman times. Because that's literally it. These men were multi-role in, and this is very important because, you know, um, at this point infantry was still important in general. I mean, even levy infantry is good. But as long as the vassalatic beneficiary system and feudal system progress, the majority of the peasants would simply be worthless as infantry. Then, between the, especially the 12th and the 14th century, infantry starts gaining more power. I mean, cavalry at that point is at, at its height, but infantry starts being kind of a might to be reckoned with on the battle. At the beginning of the 14th century, you start having the, the open victories of infantry that fought solely as infantry. I mean, without cavalry support, defeating armies of knights, that this is the kind of progress, that had the transformation, how it happened. But what you see is that by the uh, say between the eight, the, the say the ninth, the the eleventh century, objectively infantry is important. Is still 
can still defeat cavalry, or at least withstand it. So cavalry is still not all necessarily decisive. It also has problems in certain given terrain, but that's exactly what you find, especially in that time, cavalrymen dismounting on a regular pace and fighting essentially on foot uh, quite easily as you know, even in, in shield walls, right? Uh, later knights would do the same thing, actually, but they were conceived in a, you know, they were heavier, they were kind of, um, I mean, from one side, they, they were more individualistic in the way they fought, even on foot, right? But in, in this time, in the high middle ages, it seems to me that cavalrymen were quite very used to this mount um, and even form a solid formation because uh, there was no one else who, who had, at that point, the, the solidity, uh, let's say, the reliability to do it, it as as good as this dismounted cavalryman could do. Ob obviously, cavalry has intrinsic advantages in attack, so uh, that's uh, what you, you would employ preferably your troops like. But even if, if you meet someone from the other side that... Uh, maybe is you know is attacking you, or in cavalry can't defend if not counterattacking, which is not defending. Case of Poitiers is very emblematic. But well, you would like you would dismount to meet the enemy, uh, and that's that's quite important. That's that's quite a, a valid option. It's repeated again and again. Together, however, with this um, pro progressive um, um, increase and uh, systematization of cavalry charges performed over and over and over so that they would become always more punching, always more um, deadly and uh, and eventually, you know, in parallel with the, de the, the, the development of, say, knightly class. In Merovingian times, we even assist to an increase in armor, right? You know, the early Franks were uh, largely unarmored, traditionally speaking, when they're riding Gaul, they still fought with this tiny elite, the others fighting naked. Also, this strife for, for this reason that they, they concentrated everything on, on the charge and the impetus, because they, they couldn't withstand for a long time the melee as such, and that's why all this strong charge. But in, in, in um, you know, later Merovingian times, you see appearing armor, you know, named in sources. Frequently, this thing that you you realize that that the guys are you know fighting ever more on horseback and ever more armored, better kept in general, right? Right. And we will dedicate, hopefully, lots of videos to this because we haven't touched the, the issue quite quite clearly. But it's something we have to discuss quite quite seriously because it doesn't seem to me that that there is a great interest in in these stages of development. Right now, I, I told you about this just en passant very imprecisely, but, you know, roughly, th this is really the sequence, right? So, even to get the essentials here is, you know, is a challenge seen in popular culture, then there is actually a lot of documentation that we will have to examine this quite in detail um, over time. All right, so I think for now we can stop it here. I, there would be a lot more to add, right? So this is a first broader introduction on the um, on, on the uh, excuse me on the Merovingian army, and uh, naturally we will deepen uh, in the topic many other times. It's just a general picture, and yeah, and I care about especially the privatization of the political culture of Frankish society. If, if you get that, you get kind of half of medieval history. Without that, it, it's just half, <laughs> you know, uh, of, of, of misconceptions essentially, and um, okay, so let's stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.